Long Stories, Chapter 1, The White Elephant Once upon a time, there lived a herd of 80,000 elephants at the bottom of the majestic Himalayas. Their leader was a magnificent and rare white elephant who was an extremely kind heart and soul. He greatly loved his mother who had grown blind and feeble and could not look out for herself. Each day this white elephant would go deep into the forest in search of food. He would look for the best of wild fruit to send to his mother. But alas, his mother never received any. This was because his messengers would always eat them up themselves. Each night, when he returned home he would be surprised to hear that his mother had been starving all day. He was absolutely disgusted with his herd. Then one day, he decided to leave them all behind and disappeared in the middle of the night, along with his dear mother. He took her to Mount Kandarana to live in a cave, beside a beautiful lake that was covered by gorgeous pink lotuses. It so happened that one day, when the white elephant was feeding he heard loud cries. A forester from Benares had lost his way in the forest and was absolutely terrified. He had come to the area to visit relatives and could not find his way out. On seeing this big white elephant he was even more terrified and ran as fast as he could. The elephant followed him and told him not to be afraid as all he wanted to do was to help him. He asked the forester why he was crying so bitterly. The forester replied that he was crying because he had been roaming the forest for the past seven days and could not find his way out. The elephant told him not to worry, as he knew every inch of this forest and could take him to safety. He then lifted him onto his back and carried him to the edge of the forest from where the forester went on his merry way, back to Benares. On reaching the city, he heard that King Brahmadutta's personal elephant had just died, and the king was looking for a new elephant. His heralds were roaming the city, announcing that any man who had seen or heard of an elephant fit for a king should come forward with the information. The forester was very excited and immediately went up to the king and told him about the white elephant that he had seen on Mount Kandarana. He told him that he had marked the way and would require the help of the elephant trainers in order to catch this fantastic elephant. The king was quite pleased with the information and immediately dispatched a number of soldiers and elephant trainers along with the forester. After traveling for many days, the group reached the lake besides which the elephants resided. They slowly moved down to the edge of the lake and hid behind the bushes. The white elephant was collecting lotus shoots for his mother's meal and could sense the presence of humans. When he looked up, he spotted the forester and realized that it was he who had led the king's men to him. He was very upset at the ingratitude but decided that if he put up a struggle many of the men would be killed and he was just too kind to hurt anyone. So, he decided to go along with them to Benares, and then request the benevolent king to be set free. That night when the white elephant did not return home, his mother was very worried. She had heard all the commotion outside and had guessed that the king's men had taken away her son. She was scared that the king would ride him into battle, and her son would definitely be killed. She was also worried that there would be no one to look after her or even feed her. As she could not see, she just lay down and cried bitterly. Meanwhile her son was led into the beautiful city of Benares, where he was given a grand reception. The whole city was decorated and his own stable was gaily painted and covered with garlands of fragrant flowers. The trainers laid out a feast for their new state elephant who refused to touch a morsel. He did not respond to any kind of stimuli, be it the fragrant flowers or the beautiful and comfortable stable. He just sat there looking completely despondent. The worried trainers went straight to report the situation to 
their king, as they were scared that the elephant would just waste away without any food or water. The king was extremely concerned when he heard what they had to say, and went to the stable himself. He offered the elephant food from the royal table and asked him why he grieved in this manner. He thought that the elephant should be proud, and honored that he was chosen as the state elephant, and would get the opportunity to serve his king. But the white elephant replied that he would not eat a thing until he met his mother, so the king asked him where his mother was. The elephant replied that she was back home on Mount Kandarana, and must be worried and hungry as she was blind and had no one to feed her and take care of her. He was afraid that she would die. The compassionate king was touched by the elephant's story and asked him to return to his blind, old mother and take care of her as he had been doing all along. He set him free in love and kindness. The happy elephant went running home as fast as he could, and he was relieved to find that his mother was still alive. He filled his trunk with water and poured it over his sick mother, who thought that it was raining. Then she cried out as she thought that, some evil spirit had come to harm her and wished and prayed that her son was there to save her. The white elephant gently bent over his blind mother and stroked her lovingly. She immediately recognized his touch and was overjoyed. Her son lifted her up and told her that the kind and compassionate king of Benares had set him free, and he was here to love and look after his mother forever. His mother was absolutely thrilled, and blessed the kind king with peace, prosperity and joy till the end of his days. She was so thankful to him for sending her son back home. The white elephant was able to take good care of his mother till the day she died. And when he died himself, the king erected a statue of him by the side of the lake and held an annual elephant festival there, in memory of such a caring and noble soul. Moral, always give affection and care to our dear ones. Always respect others' feelings. Chapter 2. Mother's Sacrifice My mom only had one eye. I hated her. She was such an embarrassment. My mom ran a small shop at a flea market. She collected little weeds and such to sell. Anything for the money we needed she was such an embarrassment. There was this one day during elementary school. I remember that it was field day and my mom came. I was so embarrassed. How could she do this to me? I threw her a hateful look and ran out. The next day at school, your mom only has one eye, and they taunted me. I wished that my mom would just disappear from this world. So I said to my mom, Mom, why don't you have the other eye? You're only going to make me a laughingstock. Why don't you just die? My mom did not respond. I guess I felt a little bad, but at the same time, it felt good to think that I had said what I'd wanted to say all this time. Maybe it was because my mom hadn't punished me, but I didn't think that I had hurt her feelings very badly. That night, I woke up and went to the kitchen to get a glass of water. My mom was crying there, so quietly, as if she was afraid that she might wake me. I took a look at her and then turned away. Because of the thing I had said to her earlier, there was something pinching at me in the corner of my heart. Even so, I hated my mother who was crying out of her one eye. So I told myself that I would grow up and become successful, because I hated my one-eyed mom and our desperate poverty. Then I studied really hard. I left my mother and came to Seoul and studied, and got accepted in the Seoul University with all the confidence I had. Then I got married. I bought a house of my own. Then I had kids. Two. Now I'm living happily as a successful man. I like it here because it's a place that doesn't remind me of my mom. This happiness was getting bigger and bigger. 
When someone unexpected came to see me, what? Who's this? It was my mother, still with her one eye. It felt as if the whole sky was falling apart on me. My little girl ran away, scared of my mom's eye, and I asked her, Who are you? I don't know you. As if I tried to make that real. I screamed at her, How dare you come to my house and scare my daughter? Get out of here now. And to this, my mother quietly answered, Oh, I'm so sorry. I may have gotten the wrong address. And she disappeared. Thank goodness. She doesn't recognize me. I was quite relieved. I told myself that I wasn't going to care or think about this for the rest of my life. Then a wave of relief came upon me. One day, a letter regarding a school reunion came to my house. I lied to my wife saying that I was going on a business trip. After the reunion, I went down to the old shack that I used to call a house, just out of curiosity there. I found my mother fallen on the cold ground. But I did not shed a single tear. She had a piece of paper in her hand. It was a letter to me, she wrote. My son, I think my life has been long enough now. And I won't visit Seoul anymore. But would it be too much to ask if I wanted you to come visit me? Once in a while. I miss you so much. And I was so glad when I heard you were coming for the reunion. But I decided not to go to the school for you. I'm sorry that I only have one eye. And I was an embarrassment for you. You see, when you were very little, you got into an accident and lost your eye as a mother. I couldn't stand watching you having to grow up with only one eye. So I gave you mine. I was so proud of my son that was seeing a whole new world for me in my place with that eye. I was never upset at you for anything you did. The couple times that you were angry with me, I thought to myself, it's because he loves me. I miss the times when you were still young around me. I miss you so much. I love you. You mean the world to me. My world shattered. I hated the person who only lived for me. I cried for my mother. I didn't know of any way that will make up for my worst deeds. Moral. Never ever hate anyone for their disabilities. Never disrespect your parents. Don't ignore and underestimate their sacrifices. They give us life. They raise us better than they had been. They give and keep trying to give better than they ever had. They never wish unwell for their kids even in their wildest dreams. They always try showing right path and being motivator. Parents give up all for kids. Forgive all mistakes made by kids. There is no way to repay what they done for kids. All we can do is try giving what they need and it is just time. Love and respect. Chapter 3. The Bow and a Tree A long time ago, there was a huge apple tree. A little bow loved to come and play round it every day. He climbed to the treetop, ate the apples, took a nap under the shadow. He loved the tree and the tree loved to play with him. Time went by, the little bow had grown up and he no longer played around the tree every day. One day, the bow came back to the tree and he looked sad. Come and play with the tree, asked the bow. I am no longer a kid. I do not play around trees anymore, the bow replied. I want toes. I need money to buy them. Sorry. Beauty do not have money. But you can pick all my apples and sell them. So you will have money. The bull was so excited. He grabbed all the apples on the tree and left happily. The bull never came back after he picked the apples. The tree was it. One day, the bull who now turned into a man returned and the tree was excited come. And play with me, the tree said. I do not have time to play. I have to work for my family. We need a house for shelter. Can you help me? Sorry. But e do not have any house. But you can chop off my branches to build your house. 
So the man cut all the branches of the tree and left happily. The tree was glad to see him happy, but the man never came back since then. The tree was again lonely and sad. One hot summer day, the man returned and the tree was delighted. Come and play with me, the tree said. I am getting old. I want to go sailing to relax myself. Can you give me a boat, said the man. Use my trunk to build your boat. You can sail far away and be happy. So, the man cut the tree trunk to make a boat. He went sailing and never showed up for a long time. Finally, the man returned after many years. Sorry, my bull, but I do not have anything for you anymore. No more apples for you, the tree said. No problem, Edo not have any teeth to bite, the man replied. No more trunk for you to climb in, the tree said. I am too old for that now, the man said. I really cannot give you anything. The only thing left is my dying roots, the tree said with tears. I do not need much now, just a place to rest. I am tired after all these years, the man replied. Good. Old tree roots are the best place to lean on and rest. Come, come sit down with me and rest. The man sat down and the tree was glad and smiled with tears. Moral, the tree is like our parents when we were young. We love to play with our mom and dad. When we grow up, we leave them. Only come to them when we need something or when we are in trouble. No matter what, parents will always be there and give everything they could just to make you happy. You may think the bull is cruel to the tree, but that is how all of us treat our parents. We take them for granted we don't appreciate all they do for us until it's too late. Chapter 4 The Wooden Bull A frail old man went to live with his son, daughter-in-law. And for your old grandson, the old man's hands trembled, his eyesight was blurred, and his step faltered. The family ate together at the table, but the elderly grandfather's shaky hands and failing sight made eating difficult. Peas rolled off his spoon onto the floor. When he grasped the glass, milk spilled on the tablecloth. The son and daughter-in-law became irritated with the mess. We must do something about father, said the son. I've had enough of his spilled milk. Noisy eating and food on the floor. So the husband and wife set a small table in the corner. There, grandfather ate alone while the rest of the family enjoyed dinner. Since grandfather had broken a dish or two, his food was served in a wooden bowl when the family glanced in grandfather's direction. Sometime he had a tear in his eye as he sat alone, still. The only words the couple had for him were sharp admonitions when he dropped a fork or spilled food. The four-year-old watched it all in silence. One evening before supper, the father noticed his son playing with wood scraps on the floor. He asked the child sweetly, What are you making? Just as sweetly, the boy responded, Oh. I am making a little bowl for you and Mama to eat your food in when I grow up. The four-year-old smiled and went back to work. The words so struck the parents so that they were speechless. Then tears started to stream down their cheeks. Though no word was spoken, both knew what must be done. That evening the husband took grandfather's hand and gently led him back to the family table. For the remainder of his days he ate every meal with the family, and for some reason, neither husband nor wife seemed to care any longer when a fork was dropped, milk spilled, or the tablecloth sold. Moral, you reap what you sow. Regardless of your relationship with your parents, you'll miss them when they're gone from your life. Always respect, care for and love them. Chapter 5. Until Death Do Us Apart 
When I got home, that night as my wife served dinner, I held her hand and said, I've got something to tell you. She sat down and ate quietly. Again I observed the hurt in her eyes. Suddenly I didn't know how to open my mouth, but I had to let her know what I was thinking. I want a divorce. I raised the topic calmly. She didn't seem to be annoyed by my words. Instead she asked me softly, Why? I avoided her question. This made her angry. She threw away the chopsticks and shouted at me. You are not a man. That night, we didn't talk to each other. She was weeping. I knew she wanted to find out what had happened to our marriage. But I could hardly give her a satisfactory answer. She had lost my heart to Jane. I didn't love her anymore. I just pitied her. With a deep sense of guilt, I drafted a divorce agreement which stated that she could own our house, our car, and 30% stake of my company. She glanced at it and then tore it into pieces. The woman who had spent ten years of her life with me had become a stranger. I felt sorry for her wasted time, resources, and energy. But I could not take back what I had said, for I loved Jane so dearly. Finally she cried loudly in front of me, which was what I had expected to see. To me her cry was actually a kind of release. The idea of divorce, which had obsessed me for several weeks, seemed to be firmer and clearer now. The next day, I came back home very late and found her writing something at the table. I didn't have supper, but went straight to sleep and fell asleep very fast. Because I was tired after an eventful day with Jane. When I woke up, she was still there at the table writing. I just did not care so I turned over and was asleep again. In the morning she presented her divorce conditions. She didn't want anything from me, but needed a month's notice before the divorce. She requested that in that one month, we both try to live as normal a life as possible. Her reason for this conditions were simple. Our son had his exams in a month's time, and she didn't want to disrupt him with our broken marriage. This was agreeable to me, but she had something more. She asked me to recall how I had carried her into our bridal room on our wedding day. She requested that every day for the month's duration, I carry her out of our bedroom to the front door every morning. I thought she was going crazy. Just to make our last days together bearable, I accepted her odd request. I told Jane about my wife's divorce conditions. She laughed loudly and thought it was absurd. No matter what tricks she applies, she has to face the divorce, she said scornfully. My wife and I hadn't had any body contact. Since my divorce intention was explicitly expressed, so when I carried her out on the first day, we both appeared clumsy. Our son clapped behind us. Daddy is holding mommy in his arms. His words brought me a sense of pain. From the bedroom to the sitting room, then to the door. I walked over ten meters with her in my arms. She closed her eyes and said softly, Don't tell our son about the divorce. I nodded, feeling somewhat upset. I put her down outside the door. She went to wait for the bus to work. I drove alone to the office. On the second day, both of us acted much more easily. She leaned on my chest. I could smell the fragrance of her blouse. I realized that I hadn't looked at this woman carefully. For a long time, I realized she was not young anymore. There were fine wrinkles on her face. Her hair was graying. Our marriage had taken its toll on her. For a minute I wondered what I had done to her. On the fourth day, when I lifted her up, I felt a sense of intimacy returning. This was the woman who had given ten years of her life to me. On the fifth and sixth day, I realized that our sense of intimacy was growing again. I didn't tell Jane about this. It became easier to carry her as the month slipped by. Perhaps the everyday workout made me stronger. She was choosing what to wear one morning. She tried on quite a few dresses, but could not find a suitable one. Then she sighed. All my dresses have grown bigger.
I suddenly realized that she had grown so thin. That was the reason why I could carry her more easily. Suddenly it hit me. She had buried so much pain and bitterness in her heart. Subconsciously I reached out and touched her head. Our son came in at the moment and said, Dad, it's time to carry Mom out, to him. Seeing his father carrying his mother out had become an essential part of his life. My wife gestured to our son to come closer and hugged him tightly. I turned my face away because I was afraid I might change my mind at this last minute. I then held her in my arms, walking from the bedroom, through the sitting room, to the hallway, her hand surrounded my neck softly and naturally. I held her body tightly, it was just like our wedding day, but her much lighter weight made me sad, on the last day. When I held her in my arms I could hardly move a step. Our son had gone to school, I held her tightly and said, I hadn't noticed that our life lacked intimacy. I drove to office and jumped out of the car swiftly without locking the door. I was afraid any delay would make me change my mind. I walked upstairs. Jane opened the door and I said to her, Sorry, Jane. I do not want the divorce anymore. She looked at me, astonished, and then touched my forehead. Do you have a fever? She said. I moved her hand off my head, sorried, Jane, I said, I won't divorce. My marriage life was boring probably, because she and I didn't value the details of our lives, not because we didn't love each other anymore. Now I realize that, since I carried her into my home on our wedding day, I'm supposed to hold her, until death do us apart. Jane seemed to suddenly wake up. She gave me a loud slap and then slammed the door and burst into tears. I walked downstairs and drove away. I ordered a bouquet of flowers for my wife. The sales girl asked me what to write on the card. I smiled and wrote, I'll carry you out every morning until death to us apart. That evening I arrived home, flowers in my hands, a smile on my face. I run upstairs only to find my wife in the bed, dead. My wife had been fighting cancer for months, and I was so busy with Jane to even notice, she knew that she would die soon. And she wanted to save me, from the whatever negative reaction from our son, in case we push through with the divorce. At least, in the eyes of our son, I'm a loving husband. Moral, the small details of your lives are what really matter in a relationship. It is not the mansion, the car, property, the money in the bank. These create an environment conducive for happiness, but cannot give happiness in themselves, so find time to be your spouse's friend. And do those little things for each other that build intimacy, and have a real happy marriage. Chapter 6. The Story of Thumbelina Once upon a time, a simple and kind-hearted woman lived carrying one desire in her mind. She had only one simple dream. Her dream was to have a baby girl. Days and months passed by, but her dream did not come true. Her desire to have a little girl grow stronger and stronger. One day to make her dream come true, she visited a witch. She expressed her desire to have a baby girl. The witch offered a magic barley grain and asked her to plant it. The birth of Thumbelinalta the woman wasn't happy. She had a hope and planted the magic grain in a flower pot. To her surprise, the very next day, the magic barley grew into a beautiful big flower bud, which appeared like a tulip. Mesmerized by the beauty of the flower, she softly and gently kissed the bud, since it was a magic flower. It blossomed instantly with her kiss on the bud. The woman was greatly surprised as inside the flower sat a tiny and cute little girl who looked as small as a thumb. The woman named her Thumbelina. Thumbelina's life, she became the part of the woman's life. The woman provided Thumbelina everything she needed. 
She used walnut shell as her bed, petals of violet flower as her mattress, and petals of beautiful roses as her blanket. Thumbelina played in the paddle boat of the tulip, and floated on a plate of water. She used to horse hairs as oars to sail round the lake. She had a beautiful voice. She played, floated, rowed the boat, and sailed round by singing and singing and singing beautifully. Thumbelina snatched by a cunning frog after playing for a long time. Thumbelina fell asleep in her walnut shell. As she was sleeping, a huge frog looked at sleeping Thumbelina. In the shell through the window, the frog simply gazed at her, stunned at her beauty. She thought that Thumbelina would be the right girl for her son and picked her, ran away with her. Unfortunately, no one noticed Thumbelina snatched by a frog. The large frog carried her to the pond where her family lives. She introduced the beautiful Thumbelina to her ugly and fatty son, who was a mama's boy. Even the ugly son pleased when he saw her. However, both the mom and son frogs were frightened that the beautiful prisoner a escaped from them. Rather than let her run away from their custody, she put Thumbelina in a water lily and put the lily into the middle of the pond. Mom and son were happy that Thumbelina won't be able to escape from there. In the meanwhile, they both started preparing for the marriage. How Thumbelina escaped from the trap. The bitter talks of the frogs were heard by two minnows that were playing in the pond. They decided to help Thumbelina escape from the trap. The minnows, with the help of a butterfly, pushed the lily. The leaf with lily floated far away from the pond, and Thumbelina escaped. Thumbelina encountered many problems. Although Thumbelina escaped from the frogs, she was soon captured by a beetle. However, very soon the beetle freed Thumbelina as she appeared very different. The summer approached and Thumbelina wandered in grasslands and across the flowers. She hardly found good food to eat. She ate pollen as her meals and dew as her drink. Soon the rainy season appeared. It made the places nasty. The little girl struggled to hard to find good shelter, even though she recovered from the heavy water drops of rainy season. The winter made her struggle even more. The winter was terrible, and she could not find food. While she was roaming on the meadows, a big spider offered her help to provide food and shelter. The spider took her to a hollow tree and fed her with chestnuts. When the spider called his family to meet his new friend, the beautiful Thumbelina, others discriminated her as she looked different. She cried loudly and left spider's home. Again. She wandered on the cold meadows. She saw a little cottage made of wood and leaves. Thumbelina decided to request help and knocked the door of the little cottage. It was a house of a mouse. The mouse was amazed at the beauty of Thumbelina. She requested him to help her and offer her shelter. The field mouse asked her to stay with him, as long as she wishes. One day, the field mouse brought a friend, a rich mole. Field mouse asked Thumbelina to sing a song, and she sang so beautifully. And the mouse and the mole were well impressed by her singing. The field mouse ordered Thumbelina to marry the mole as he was very rich. The mouse was so cruel to her, and she decided to run away from him. The mole planned for their marriage in the summer. During the onset of spring, the swallow was completely cured and decided to fly away. After a few days. She nursed a swallow bird and gave her food every day. They became closer, and the swallow bird shared her story. She offered Thumbelina to join her. She made every possible attempt to escape from the mole marrying her. She was thinking and horrified how she go and live in a tunnel with mole for the whole life. Just before a day of her wedding, the swallow asked her to join and spend the day in the sky, without a second thought. Thumbelina grabbed the finger of the bird. The bird carried Thumbelina over the hills, meadows, plains, and until they reached the flower country. The country was full of colorful flowers. The swallow gently placed her on a beautiful flower, where she met the king of flower fairies. They lived happily ever after. Chapter Seven: 
the gardener, and the noble family. About four miles from the city stood an old manor house, with thick walls, towers, and pointed gables, here lived, but only in the summer season, a rich and noble family, of all the different estates they own. This was the best and the most beautiful, on the outside. It looked as if it had just been cast in a foundry, and the inside was made for comfort and ease. The family coat of arms was carved in stone over the gate. Beautiful roses climbed about the arms and the balconies. The courtyard was covered with grass. There were red thorn and white thorn, and many rare flowers even outside the greenhouse. The owners of the manor house also had a very skillful gardener. It was a pleasure to see the flower garden, the orchard, and the vegetable garden, a part of the manor's original. Old garden was still there, consisting of a few box tree hedges cut so that they formed crowns and pyramids. Behind these stood the old, mighty trees, almost always without leaves, and one might easily think that a storm or a water spat had scattered great lumps of dirt on their branches, but each lump was a bird's nest. Here, from time immemorial, a screaming swarm of crows and rooks had built their nests. It was a regular bird town, and the birds were the owners, the manor's oldest family, the real lordship. The people below meant nothing to them. They tolerated these crawling creatures, even if every now and then they shot with their guns, making the birds' backbones shiver, so that every bird flew up in fear and cry, rack, rack. The gardener often spoke to the noble family about cutting down the old trees. They did not look well, and by taking them away, they might also get rid of the shrieking birds, which then would probably look for another place. But the family did not want to give up either the trees or the swarm of birds. That was something the manor could not lose, something from the olden times, which should never be forgotten. Why? Those trees are the birds' heritage by this time, so let them keep them, my good Larson. Larson was the gardener's name, but that is of very little consequence to this story. Haven't you space enough to work in? Little Larson, have you not the flower garden, the greenhouse, the orchard, and the vegetable garden? Yes, those he had, and he cared for them. He kept them in order and cultivated them with affection and ability, and that the noble family knew. But they did not conceal from him that they often saw flowers and tasted fruits in other people's homes that surpassed what they had in their garden. And that made the gardener sad, for he always wished to do his best and really did his best. He was good-hearted and a good and faithful worker. One day the noble family sent for him and told him, very kindly, that the day before, at some distinguished friend's home, they had eaten apples and pears that were so juicy and so well flavored that they and all the other guests had expressed their admiration. It was doubtful if the fruits were native, but they ought to be imported and grown here, provided the climate would permit it. It was known that they had been bought from the finest fruit dealer in the city, and it was decided that the gardener was to go there and find out where these apples and pears came from and then order some slips for grafting. The gardener knew the fruit dealer well, because he was the very person to whom he sold the superfluous fruit that grew in the manor garden. And the gardener went to town and asked the dealer, where he got those highly praised apples and pears, why, they are from your own garden, said the fruit dealer, and showed him both the apples and pears which he recognized immediately dot how happy the gardener felt. He hurried back to the family and told them that both the apples and pears, why, they are from your own garden, said the fruit dealer, and showed him both the apples and pears, which he recognized immediately. How happy the gardener felt. He hurried back to the family and told them that both the apples and the pears were from their own garden, that they couldn't believe. That's not possible, Larson, 
Can you get a written guarantee to that effect from the fruit dealer? Yes, that he could, and a written guarantee he brought. That certainly is remarkable, said the noble family. Now every day great dishes filled with wonderful apples, and pears from their own garden were set on the table. Bushels and barrels of these fruits were sent to friends in the city. And outside the city, yes, even to foreign lands. This afforded great pleasure, yet the family added that the last two summers had, of course, been remarkably good for tree fruits and these had done very well all over the country. Some time passed, the family were dinner guests at court. The next day they sent for the gardener. At the royal table they had eaten melons, very juicy and wonderfully flavored, from their majesty's greenhouse. You must go to the court gardener, my good Larson, and let him give you some seeds of those precious melons. But the court gardener got his melon seeds from us, said the gardener, very pleased. Then that man knows how to bring the fruit to a higher perfection, answered the family. Each melon was splendid. Well, then, I really can feel proud, said the gardener. I must tell your lordship that the court gardener had had bad luck with his melons this year. And when he saw how beautiful ours looked, and then tasted them, he ordered three of them for the castle. Larson, don't try to tell us that those were melons from our garden. I really believe so, said the gardener, and he went to the court gardener, from whom he got a written guarantee to the effect that the melons on the royal table were from the manor. This was really a big surprise to the family, and they did not keep the story to themselves. The written guarantee was displayed, and melon seeds were sent far and wide, as grafting slips had been earlier. These slips, the family learned, had taken and begun to bear fruit of an excellent kind. This was named after the family manor, and the name became known in English, German, and French. This. No one had expected. Let's hope the gardener won't get big ideas about himself, said the family. But he took it in a different way. He would strive now to be known as one of the best gardeners in the country. And to produce something superior, out of all sorts of garden stuff every year, and that he did. But often he was told that the very first fruits he brought out, the apples and the pears, were, after all, the best, that all later variations were very inferior to these. The melons were very good, to be sure, though, of course, they belonged to another species. His strawberries might be called delicious, but no better than those grown by other gardeners. And when one year his radishes did not turn out very well, they spoke only of the unsuccessful radishes. And not about all the other fine products he had developed. It almost seemed as if the family felt a relief in saying, It didn't go well this year, little Larson. Yes, they seemed quite happy when they said, It didn't go well this year. Twice a week the gardener brought fresh flowers up to their drawing room, always arranged with such taste and artistry that the colors seemed to appear even brighter. You have good taste, Larson, said the noble family, but that is a gift from our Lord, not from yourself. Everyone who saw it found it remarkably beautiful and unusual. Yes, even the most hibern young lady in the country, the wise and kind hearted princess, said so. One day the gardener brought a large crystal bowl. In it floated a water lily leaf upon which was laid a beautiful blue flower as big as a sunflower. The lotus of Hindustan, exclaimed the family. They had never seen a lotus flower before. In the daytime, it was placed in the sunlight and in the evening under artificial light. The family considered it an honor to present her with the flower, and the princess took it with her to the castle. Then they went down to their garden to pick another flower of the same kind. But none was to be found, so they sent for the gardener. And asked him where he got the blue lotus flower. We have been looking for it in vain, they said. 
We have been in the greenhouses and round about the flower garden. Oh, no, it's not there, said the gardener. It is only a common flower from the vegetable garden. But, look, isn't it beautiful? It looks like a blue cactus, and yet it is only the flower of the artichoke. You should have told us that immediately, said the noble family. Naturally, we supposed it was a rare, foreign flower. You have ridiculed us to the young princess. She saw the flower in our house and thought it was beautiful. She didn't know the flower, although she knows her botany well. But then, of course, that science has nothing to do with kitchen herbs. How could you do it, Larson? To place such a flower in our drawing room is enough to make us ridiculous. And the gorgeous blue flower from the vegetable garden was taken out of the drawing room where it didn't belong, yes. And the noble family apologized to the princess and told her that the flower was only a kitchen herb, that the gardener had had the idea of exhibiting, and that he had been severely reprimanded for it. That was a shame. And very unfair, said the princess. He has really opened our eyes to a magnificent flower we otherwise would have paid no attention to. He has shown us beauty where we didn't expect to find it. As long as the artichoke is in bloom, our court gardener shall daily bring one of them up to my private room. And this was done. The noble family told the gardener that he could again bring them a fresh artichoke flower. It is really beautiful. They said, highly remarkable, and the gardener was praised. Larson likes that," said the noble family. "He is like a spoiled child." In the autumn, there was a terrific storm. During the night, it increased so violently that many of the large trees in the outskirts of the wood were torn up by their roots. And to the great grief of the noble family, yes, they called it grief, but to the gardener's delight. The two big trees with all the birds' nests blew down. Through the storm, one could hear the screaming of the crows and the rooks as they beat their wings against the manor windows. Now, of course, you are happy, Larson," said the noble family. "The storm has felled the trees, and the birds have gone off into the forest. There is nothing from olden times left to see here. Every sign and reference has disappeared. It makes us very sad." The gardener said nothing, but he thought of what he had long had in his mind: how he could make use of that wonderful, sunny spot. Now at his disposal, it could become the pride of the garden and the joy of the family. The large trees, in falling, had crushed the very old box tree hedges with all their fancy trimmings. Here he put in a multitude of plants, native plants from the fields and the woods. What no other gardener had ever thought of planting in a manor garden, he planted, giving each its appropriate soil and sunlight or shadow, according to what the individual plant required. He gave them loving care, and everything grew magnificently. The juniper tree from the heaths of Jutland rose in shape and color like the Italian cypress. The shiny, thorny Christ's thorn evergreen. In the cold of winter and the sun of summer, was beautiful to behold. In the foreground grew ferns of various species. Some of them looked as if they were children of the palm tree. Others as if they were parents of the pretty plant we call Venus's hair. Here stood the neglected burdock, so pretty in its freshness that it can be outstanding in a bouquet. The burdock stood in a dry place, but further down, in the moist soil. Grew the colt's foot, also a neglected plant and yet very picturesque with its enormous leaf and its tall stem, six feet tall, with flower after flower. Like an enormous, many-armed candelabra, rose the mullein, just a mere field plant. Here grew the woodruff, the primrose, and the lily of the valley, the wild calla and the fine three-leaved wood sorrel. It was all wonderful to see. In the front. In rows grew very tiny pear trees from French soil, fastened to steel wires. By getting plenty of sun and good care, they soon bore fruit as large and juicy as in their own country.
In place of the two old leafless trees was set a tall flagpole, from which Danabreg, the flag of Denmark, proudly flew, and close by stood another pole, around which the hop tendril twisted, and wound its fragrant flower cones in the summer, and at harvest time, but on which in the winter, according to an old custom, oat sheaves were hung, so that the birds could have a good meal. During the happy Christmas time, our good Larson is getting sentimental in his old age, said the family, but he is true and faithful to us. At New Year's, one of the city illustrated papers published a picture of the old manor. It showed the flagpole and the oat sheaves for the birds at the happy Christmas time. And the paper commented that it was a beautiful thought to uphold and honor this old custom so appropriate to the old manor. Anything that Larson does, said the noble family, they beat the drum for, he is a lucky man, we should almost be proud to have him. But they were not a bit proud of it. They knew they were the masters of the manor, and they could dismiss Larson, but that they wouldn't do. They were good people, and there are many good people of their kind in the world, and that is fortunate for all the Larsons. Yes, that is the story of the gardener and the noble family. Now you may think about it. Chapter 8 Little Red's Revenge First you must know the wonderful story of Little Red Riding Hood. If you don't know, the wolf ate up her grandma and then ate Little Red up too. But, the woodcutter saved the day and got them back. So this is the story of how the woodcutter, Grandma Red, and Little Red got the wolf back. Once upon a time, lived a little girl. She had a Little Red Riding Hood that was given her that she wore so much that everybody killed her little red riding hood. She had a grandma who was very ill. Her and her grandma didn't see each other much because they both lived in different villages. But one sunny autumn day, Little Red got a call from her grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood, do you remember that nasty old wolf? asked Grandma. Why, yes, Grandma. I remember that big bad wolf who ate us both up. Little Red said, And do you remember that nice woodcutter? Grandma said, Why, yes, Grandma, I remember that nice woodcutter who got us out of the wolf. Little Red said, The nice woodcutter came to my cottage. He would like you to join us for tea while we talk about the nasty wolf and a revenge plan. Grandma said, So Little Red Riding Hood, put three small girdle cakes in her picnic basket and started to her grandma's little cottage. When she arrived, she saw the woodcutter and grandma sitting in two brown rocking chairs, sipping at their tea. Ah, uh, little red riding hood, glad you could make it, said the woodcutter. I have an idea to make sure that the big bad wolf doesn't gobble up anyone else. I have invited three little pigs over who claim that they had problems with the wolf too. He said again. Just then, the doorbell rang. The woodcutter answered the door and standing there were three little pigs in yellow hard hats. Their names were Alpha, Pete and Cly. The woodcutter invited them in politely. Just then, the doorbell rang again. That must be the wolf. Follow my lead, said the woodcutter. The woodcutter told the wolf to wait just a minute and cut each girdle cake that Little Red brought in half. Then he put half a girdle cake in everyone's mouth and opened the door. The wolf came in and saw everyone. He licked his lips. The woodcutter took the girdle cake out of his mouth. Hello, Mr. Wolf, he said. The wolf didn't answer but stared at Clyde, the pig whose house he couldn't blow down. Clyde saw that the wolf was looking at him and looked at the wood floor. Mr. Wolf, Please take a seat. Here, have some tea, said the woodcutter. He went into the small kitchen and poured a cup of hot tea. Then he added in a dollop of peanut butter. He gave the wolf the tea. Tea goes great with girdle cakes, riding hoods and hard hats, said the wolf. The wolf took a drink and froze. 
What did you put in my tea? asked the wolf. But you couldn't really tell what he was saying because his tongue was swollen up to the size of a loaf of bread. Oh, just the usual, sugar, beans, peanut butter, said the woodcutter. Peanut butter, how did you know that I was allergic to peanut butter? said the wolf. Well, Grandma here told me at the day that you gobbled her up. She had eaten peanuts. I also remember that you couldn't come a peat with your S's very well. Which only means that your tongue swelled up, said the woodcutter. The woodcutter then walked behind him and secretly picked up his axe. He swung the axe and HT the wolf in the furry head. Then he gobbled the wolf up and ran away. Everyone took the girdle cakes out of their mouth. And all ran away back to their own homes, except for Grandma. She was already in her own home. The good thing was that no one had wolf problems anymore. Nobody got gobbled all up, so everyone one lived happily ever after. Chapter 9 The Flax The flax was in full bloom, it had such pretty blue blossoms, as soft as the wings of a moth. And even more delicate, and the sun shone down on the flax, and the rain clouds watered it. And that was as good for it as it is for little children to be bathed and kissed by their mothers, it makes them look so much prettier. And so it did the flax. People say that I stand exceedingly well, said the flax, and that I am growing so charmingly tall that I'll make a grand piece of linen, oh. How happy I am! No one could possibly be happier. How well off I am! And I'm sure I'll be put to some good use, too. The sunshine makes me so cheerful, and the rain tastes so fresh. I'm exceedingly happy. Yes, I'm sure I'm the happiest being in the world. Oh, yes, jeered the hedge stakes. But you don't know the world the way we do. There are knots in us. And then they creaked out dolefully. Snip, snap, snur, bassler, the ballad is over. No, it's not, said the flax. The sun will shine tomorrow, and the rain is so good for me. I can hear myself grow, I can feel that I'm in blossom. Who could ever be as happy as I? But one day people came, grabbed the flax by the top, and pulled it up by the roots. Oh, how that hurt! Then it was thrown into the water as if to be drowned, and after that laid on the fire as if to be roasted. It was terrible. You can't always have what you want, said the flax. It's good to suffer sometimes, it gives you experience. But there was still worse to come. The flax was broken and cracked, hackled and scalded it, didn't even know what the operations were called, and finally put on the wheel, snur, snur. It was impossible to think clearly. I have been very happy in the past, it thought in all its pain. You should always be thankful for the happiness you've enjoyed. Chapter 10 Father Son Conversation Once day, Father was doing some work and his son came and asked, Daddy, may I ask you a question? Father said, Yeah, sure, what it is. So his son asked, Dad, how much do you make an hour? Father got bit upset and said, That's none of your business. Why do you ask such a thing? Son said, I just want to know. Please tell me, how much do you make an hour? So father told him that I make 500 rupees per hour. Oh, the little boy replied, with his head down, looking up. He said, Dad. May I please borrowers? Three hundred, the father furiously said. If the only reason you asked about my pay is so that you can borrow some money to buy a silly toe or other nonsense, then march yourself to your room and go to bed. Think why you are being so selfish. I work hard every day and do not like this childish behavior. The little bull quietly went to his room and shut the door. The man sat down and started to get even angrier about the little boy's questions. How dare he ask such questions only to get some money? After about an hour or so, the man had calmed down and started to think 
maybe there was something he really needed to buy with that hers. Three hundred and, he really didn't ask for money very often. The man went to the door of little boy's room and opened the door. Are you asleep, son? He asked. No, daddy. I'm awake, replied the bull. I've been thinking. Maybe I was too hard on you earlier, said the man. It's been a long day and I took out my aggravation on you. Here's the three hundred rupees you asked for. The little boy sat straight up, smiling. Oh, thank you, dad, he yelled. Then, reaching under his pillow, he pulled some crippled up notes. The, the man, seeing that the bull already had money, started to get angry again. The little boy slowly counted out his money, then looked up at his father. Why do you want money if you already had some? The father grumbled, because I didn't have enough, but now I do. The little boy replied, Daddy, I have hers. Five hundred now. Can I buy an hour of your time? Please come home early tomorrow. I would like to have dinner with you. Father was dumbstruck. Moral. It's just a short reminder to all of you working so hard in life. We should not let time slip through our fingers without having spent some time with those who really matter to us. Those close to our hearts, if we die tomorrow, the company that we are working for could easily replace us in a matter of days, but the family and amp. Friends we leave behind will feel the loss for the rest of their lives and come to think of it. We pour ourselves more into work than to our family. Please like, share, and subscribe to my page and channel. Channel VSX Learning English. Page of Focused English.